What's up, Brian Tong here, and this is my review for the Apple iPhone 14 Pro and 14 Pro Max. So, you know, I'm gonna cover the big features that matter, and then we're gonna talk about if this makes sense to upgrade for you or not. And design-wise, look at these guys. I mean, the new iPhones, they don't look all that different. I mean, they still have the flat body, flat edge design with the rounded corners here. And yes, you're gonna instantly notice that the dynamic island here on the front, it does take place of the notch, but it moves further down into the screen. Now the camera array is larger compared to the 13 Pros, but using it for a week, not a single person recognized that I was using an iPhone 14 in the wild before its release. And now, you know, Apple sent me these two phones for review and they will go right back to them. But the two colors that I have here are space black for the 6.1 inch iPhone 14 Pro and then deep purple for the 6.7 inch 14 Pro Max. And both bring an even brighter display at 2000 nits peak brightness and that's the highest out of any phone right now but it is the new new color, this purple, that just really lives up to its name, deep purple. Now in some lighting it can almost look exactly the same as space black which still comes off kind of more as a deep gray from compared to like an actual black and other times if the light hits this just right I mean you will see tints of purple but this is not an in-your-face purple that just pops and honestly that does make sense for a pro device now on the surface you might not think much has changed just because it looks a whole lot the same it didn't get a redesigned look or a redesigned body but a whole lot has changed inside now when we look at this the screen right away the dynamic island it cannot be missed I mean you'll see it every day and I might be wrong but what I've noticed the most about this new iPhone is that it's new always on display now we know always on displays they have been around for years on Android devices and hey don't hate me for saying this because mm, I hate saying it because it sounds so cheesy out loud but the iPhone 14 Pro's always on display is done the Apple way and it works hand in hand with the new iOS 16 by creating your own wallpapers with your own widgets and custom layouts and then creating different ones for different focus modes it will really make your phone feel brand new like brand spanking new and iOS 16 is more than just a fresh coat of paint I think it's really one of the best iOS's in a long time for the iPhone in years and it will make you feel like you get a brand new phone but then the always on display takes this thing up another level right and enhances the usability of your new iOS 16 wallpapers and sure you know always on it dims the display but you can still see the time you see the date and all your widgets clearly while still seeing your wallpaper and I took the phone around Disneyland and I did notice this the most when I was actually walking through the Haunted Mansion line and it just looked like my display was still on but it was actually in always on display mode I mean I was instantly impressed and I said damn okay this stands out now always on display mode on an iPhone 14 Pro goes up to 500 its brightness no one else is doing that and then there's other things that are contributing to this First of all, you got the efficiency of the A16 Bionic. That is always part of the equation, you know, with anything iPhone feature related. You also have their new LTPO technology for the display that has a refresh rate that goes down to one hertz. And that also helps conserve battery life and then still contributes to getting a full day of battery. Apple also made a new low power supply specifically for the iPhone 14 Pro's new always on display. And then there's a coprocessor that doesn't use any CPU power for predictable updates on the display so think of things like time or a countdown where it can pre-render the visuals ahead of time now if it's a widget that's updating live scores or it's a ride sharing update or notification that's going to use the CPU power but this coprocessor is just another piece of the puzzle that helps out Apple's always on display now the number one question that people ask me is that can it really get through a day with the always on display and the answer is Yes, I mean I've been using this for a week and there's a proximity sensor that is now behind the display and it can tell when it's blocked, right? If there's occlusion, it turns off the display. If you have something like an Apple Watch and it syncs your phone, when you move far, far away enough from it, it actually turns the display off automatically. And then there's also a few Apple native apps that support the always on display mode. So for example, using maps, driving in a car, it goes from looking like this to then switching like this in always on display mode. Now recording voice memos goes from looking like this to then looking like this and also if you're taking calls it goes from this to look like this if the call 
last long enough. And why am I going so deep into this? Well, it's because this is what an always on display looks like for the Galaxy S22 Ultra. And then right next to it, this is what it looks like for the iPhone 14 Pro Max. Like, come on, which one looks better to you? Now, it surprised me how much I liked what Apple is doing with their always on display. And we haven't even seen widgets or third party live updates that are incorporated to this yet to kind of really fully unleash it. So I just love what they're doing with it. Now, when we got our first look at the new iPhones at Apple Park, Dynamic Island, right? It got all the attention, it got all the buzz. Like no one saw it coming, at least how, it sh how they showed it to us. But after using this iPhone for a week, it's the always on display that makes the biggest day-to-day -day impact for me. And I'm just happy to say that I've been able to get through a full day without needing a recharge with the always on display. In fact, this 14 Pro Max survived an entire day at Disneyland when I was testing it with photos and video tests, and I still had 32% battery left when the day was done. Now the Pro Max, it does have a higher estimated battery life at roughly 29 hours of video playback versus the 23 hours for the 14 Pro, but that is still unheard of for battery to last that long, and for reals, like try a day at Disneyland, I think that's how you know how good your phone battery is. So I might have surprised you starting with the always on display, but it is that good compared to what anyone else in the smartphone space is doing right now. And I'm gonna just tell you right now, it's a rat apple. Yeah! Okay, the next new big feature that we have to talk about is, yes, Dynamic Island. Now, is this, is this naming Dynamic Island truly peak Apple? I think it's absolutely peak Apple. And I gotta know, right, what other names were on that whiteboard? Because you know, right, there were meetings about this. There were people in a room deciding this, but I do think there was a potential miss. Maybe they should have used the spelling island. Get it? They, they should have used the spelling island or not. Okay, so yeah, you know, you look here, they move the notch a little lower and yes, the dynamic island, it covers more of your full screen content because of this. Um, in the right light, you can actually see the pill hole and the hole punch design that we had all expected. It's there. And the true depth camera system is smaller with the proximity sensor going behind the display. And I think that there are people who are gonna, you know, either love it and others that won't, but it's a really cool addition to the iPhone after using it for the past week. Now you kind of end up forgetting about it a lot like you do with the notch. I and mean, when you play with this, it, it doesn't like, it's not an eyesore quite honestly. Even if I didn't like the fact that there was something there, but now, you know, they've made it a totally usable part of the OS. Like, it's the Apple secret sauce here, a unique hardware and software solution working together that no one else is doing, and it's really smooth. Now, do I absolutely love it? I mean, no, but do I like it a whole lot? Yup, and you've got these kind of cute animations that are fun. You can interact with multiple apps on it. For example, if I go to the music player and then I play a music track, I can go back to the home screen, and if I want to, I do a long press, that's to access the mini player controls if you want, or you just do a single tap to open the app up full screen again. But then I can also go and pull up a timer and set it up here, and then it splits it into a long island. Hehe, <laughs> get it? Okay, fine, you're no fun. And then the second app is right here, and it can interact with the dynamic island as well. So I can bounce between using two apps on the dynamic island. Now people have complained to me that hey, you're gonna have to reach to it right to the top to get it, but I just don't know many people that can even swipe down from the top of their phones with their thumb with a previous Pro or Pro Maxes anymore. Like, also, I don't have baby hands, and unless you do have like really large hands, you're not gonna be able to pull that off. Like, another issue is since we're interacting with it a lot, right, you're always kinda like, depending on the app, you're checking to see what's going on with it. Will it get the front-facing camera lens dirty? Well. Yeah, it probably will, but I've also been wiping down my front-facing camera all the time, even before the Dynamic Island was here. So it, to me, it's not that big of a worry. Now, visually, it is fun. It brings new functionality while giving you like this heads up with these cool, clever animations. Like when you use something like Face ID, you see cool animation. Or when you receive a, an airdrop for someone, 
it also indicates that to you on the dynamic island. Or when you're even just taking a phone call, this is really cool. The person on the other side of the call, their waveform, it kind of shows their side in green when they talk, and then yours on the right side is orange when you talk. I mean, that's just cool. It, it, it brings a little charm here, and there's just a lot of little things that enhance the experience of the phone with a dynamic island. And sometimes, you know, you do say like, oh, that's cool, and this is just the beginning, right? It currently supports third-party apps using the Now Playing API, so these are apps like YouTube or Pandora and Spotify that they show up with, you know, kind of an interaction on the dynamic island. Now, you also have third-party apps that are using the Call Kit API. Those are also compatible on launch, so that's things like WhatsApp or Google Voice or Skype, and then Apple themselves. They have a lot of these first-party dynamic island uh, experiences. I mean, that that's what they call them, not me, you know, it's Apple, but I mentioned some of them before, but there's also others like uh, the ability to connect to your AirPods. You'll see a cool little animation up here, or if you're turning your phone into silent mode, um, that will also kind of give you an indicator. Uh, also, there's live activities that are actively happening when you're taking a video screen capture or something like when you're using your phones as a hotspot, you, you see different things in this dynamic island. Um, does it sound gimmicky? Maybe, but I think when you use it daily, you'll see that this is not a gimmick. Plus, there's a green camera and orange microphone indicators that show up and appear when those are being used, so that helps you be aware of that in case you know, you're worried about your privacy. But I just think it's really been fun using it so far, and it'll be able to do even more with third-party apps when you start talking about real-time sports scores. I'd love to see those pop up. And then even something like a ride-sharing app, you see the status up there, that's gonna be really cool. Now. I do think its biggest drawback is when you're watching full screen video. Damn, I mean, it is really an eyesore. Like, I like using it, but when I'm watching video, you know, even if you're playing something like a full screen game, you, you just can't not see it, it's there. But at the same time, if I bought, a, bought into the idea of an iPhone with a notch, which I really hated, like, I, it clearly, that wasn't enough for, to, to turn me away from the iPhone and the dynamic island, this is even better functionality wise than the notch and that's not gonna turn me away from it this time either. So love it or leave it, taking a visit to dynamic island, that just comes down to you but uh, I'm taking that trip. Now the third big standout improvement here is the new camera system. Yes, iPhone cameras get better every year but here now you get a 65% larger sensor, you get all new 48 megapixel camera for the iPhone 14 Pros and then at least two times better low light performance for every camera and then even three times better low light performance for the ultra wide camera. Plus, you get cinematic mode at 4K HDR, 24 frames per second as an option and I will not forget about action mode either. Now, look, you're also, you're now getting four optical quality level cameras with the ultra wide. You got the 1X main camera, a 2X optical quality telephoto where previously it was doing like a, a digital zoom from 1X to 2X. So with the additional megapixels, you're now getting the optical quality of a 2X telephoto in here. You also have the final lens, right? 3X telephoto, that is still good, but you know, it does trail the 10X optical periscope lens from other phone cameras. Uh, that is really like one of the key features that Apple just needs to catch up with. That would be huge to get this in a phone like this. But hey, let's, let's take a look at some of these camera comparisons. You know, I'm just, Posting these untouched, these are straight from the camera and I took the iPhone 14 Pro Max, I took it out to D23 and Disneyland, so let's just start with the convention and this iPhone 14 Pro, it has a quad pixel sensor so most of the time it groups four pixels together to help gather four times more light and produces 12 megapixel photos itself, but if you wanna access a 48 megapixel shot for more details than, you know, and you have to shoot it in Pro Raw, that allows you more editing control, and most importantly, cropping with the most detail on an iPhone that we've seen. So here's an example of the detail in the new iPhone 14 Pro versus the 13 Pro. Uh, this is a picture with, you know, our friend Kevin, the bird from Up, and both cameras here. This shot is in Pro Raw. So as we zoom in, I had to take a big jump to show this by a lot. Look at how much detail the iPhone 14 Pro retains with the feathers and fur on Kevin while the 13 Pro starts breaking down. If you can see that, if you can't, hey, zoom in even more to check that out. But the same 
goes for this awesome shot. I was at Galaxy's Edge at Disneyland with Chewbacca who met this young boy for the very first time. It was super cute and as we zoom into his fur, you can start seeing how much detail is retained with the 14 Pro versus the 13 Pro. So it just kind of reinforces the fact that yes, the megapixels matter here. You can zoom in so much. Um, it, it The quality is incredible on here compared to any other iPhone. Now, one thing to note is that Pro RAW files, right, on the new iPhone, they do take up about two and a half to three times as much storage space as before. You know, that's compared to what a 12 megapixel photo that might take up roughly around 25 to 35 megs of storage. Well, a 14 Pro 48 megapixel Pro RAW shot takes up to roughly 85 to 105 megs of storage. So you gotta really keep that in mind for your storage options. If you, you know, whatever you choose, if you're gonna use this for photography and video, like you need to make sure you know what you're, you, you wanna get a larger size capacity. Now, I also want to take you inside of Hall D23. This is at the convention where there were some major announcements from Lucasfilm and Marvel. You know me, I love that stuff. It was so fun, but I also used it to test low light performance first from the front facing camera. Now this is supposed to be two times improved compared to the previous generation. And you can see that these images side by side, you got the 14 Pro clearly has better low light performance here, but the 13 looked to have a, a slightly sharper uh, picture capture in this case, like the image quality is just cleaner. Uh, so maybe that sometimes, I don't think my hand was that shaky, but it definitely looks that way, but it was definitely also brighter with the 14 Pro. Now here's an outside shot with the main camera, and here you can see what it looks like with night mode turned off, and then how each camera handles night mode itself. But this is a situation where I think that the 13 Pro handled it better, at least with color reproduction, but then the 14 Pro, if you look closely, it still has more detail that's retained in Shauna's hair. And if you wanna be really more color accurate, the lamps from far, far away, they were warm. And for many of the pictures that you don't see that I took, right, I have a huge gallery of pictures. The iPhone 14 Pro took pictures that more accurately represented what I could see with my own eyes in that moment. And look, these night camera shots, they're already so good now. Even if you look at the mode turned off, um, the night mode turned off, these are the cameras that are in our phones. I mean, it's pretty wild and they continue to get even better. Okay, now for the biggest glow up here, the ultra wide camera getting three times better low light performance and it absolutely shows here. I mean, this is a huge difference. This shot of the Headless Horseman brings more light, more detail period everywhere and it's the biggest improvement out of any of the cameras. I think that was one of the most exciting things to see in ultra wide that kind of catches up with and upgrades and kind of is up to par with the entire camera system. Here's another picture, here's a portrait mode. Thanks to Shauna for being my model in these shots. Now both of these look good, but the 14 Pro has a little better separation in the hair area here. And then also during the time of the day it was taken, the 14 Pro just better represented the actual lighting and color temperature where you look at the 13 Pro, it looks like it was a little enhanced, brightened up, it uses warmer tones um, come, you know, by using the earlier photonic engine. So those are some of the differences there, but let's get to the action mode video. And I took this on Big Thunder Mountain Railroad side by side with the 13 Pro. And if you look carefully, um, whenever there are more kind of extreme jarring movements on the left video, that's the 13 Pro, the 14 Pro handles it more smoothly. Like action mode, it also does a 2.8K crop on the video so it can apply the action mode effect and correct for the shake. So the shots do, they look a little scaled differently from one another. It is pushed in slightly because that's how the feature works. And then finally, this is bigger than people might think on the surface, but cinematic mode in 4K now with an option for 24 frames per second. I think that this is exciting and what an impressive tool for up and coming filmmakers to be able to change the focus in real time and also in post in 4K. Like y'all are spoiled. You don't understand, we are spoiled, I am spoiled, but you all are super spoiled, right? Cinematic mode worked just as advertised. Here's an example of Shauna. I had her tending to like her calamansi plant, which was bearing fruit, and then I could change the focus from the branch so she reached to it and then go back out to her behind the branches. You got me playing around with this Spalding basketball doing it, trying to show a little show and go, and then turn around, nail the shot, swish, nothing but net. And I, I will tell you that was honestly, that was on the first take, but this works again, just as you expected. I know not everyone is going to use this, but it is another tool in the iPhone camera's utility belt. 
So those are some of the camera samples that I have. And if your main priority is to always get the best camera the iPhone has, well then you're gonna get this phone. But if you're a content creator, right? The improved image quality, you get better low light performance across the board and then editing capabilities with 48 megapixel pro raw photos, that makes a difference. But then for most people, especially ones with a triple camera iPhone, let's say going as far back as the 11 Pro, I mean, if you're happy with it, then I wouldn't say it's a must upgrade time for you. Now also, there is no way that I can actually effectively test the crash detection feature here, which is a good thing, right? You also have the ends as well. Let's say you, uh, you wanna, let's say you wanna show off that you were at the top of Half Dome or something like that via satellite. I know, weird flex, but you can do that. Now, I'll have to wait for the service to become active here in the US and Canada. It's gonna start rolling out in November, uh, and then it'll be free for two years, for the at least for the first two years, and then it's gonna be a service, but Apple has not announced any pricing for it yet, so we'll have to test that out in person again. I, the process is actually cool, just, just to know how it works. Now, this phone also came loaded with eSIM, no SIM card tray whatsoever. This is a first for an iPhone. Um, just to be no SIM card tray. And it was very easy to just add the eSIM to the new 14 Pro. That's when I set it up after the Max Pro. It allowed asked me, oh, do you wanna move your eSIM over to a 14 Pro as well? And I felt like it might've been two steps tops. So it was pretty easy. I mean, these phones can hold up to a minimum of eight eSIMs and even more depending on the carrier. So it is the future as long as the process is easy. And I think that the carriers you need right, that are supported globally, that's the key depending on where you need to go. And it won't likely be an issue for most people. It'll become something that I think that we're just gonna end up taking for granted in the future. And also for security reasons, like someone can't take your SIM card um, physically out and then put in another phone. Now, I have to talk about the biggest bugaboo of these iPhones. You know what I'm gonna say? They still have a freaking lightning connector. And you have to imagine that Apple is maybe holding out for the next generation, but if there was any drawback or any bad Apple here, it is keeping lightning with, you know, the fact this thing can handle massive ProRes video files and ProRaw photos. Like, I'm not going to give them a pass here. It is 2022, people. You know, AirPlay, this is one of the ways to deliver files. It's still inconsistent for me. And moving some of these large ProRes videos that are like, what, 15 minutes and over, that, that's over 80 gigs in size. And that would be my biggest skirt. Hey, pump your brakes, buddy. Like, will it stop most people from buying it? No, because Apple's ecosystem pool is really that strong. I mean, but this is the biggest head scratcher. Even knowing about their licensing deals and knowing that every other product in their lineup has USB-C support in some way, shape, or form, except for their flagship product. Now, iPhone 14 Pro and Pro Max has Bluetooth 5.3 and it's made the jump there, which is nice, and possibly maybe this opens up the opportunity to get unlocked for lossless audio in the future. Not yet, but it's a possibility. And then it's also, it's still Wi-Fi 6 and not Wi-Fi 6E, even though I'd like it to be a little more future-proofed. But the iPhone 14 Pro here starts at $999. We have the iPhone 14 Pro Max. That starts at $1,099, that is for the 128 gig storage model, and then they go up to one terabyte, but you will need to purchase a minimum of the 256 gig model if you wanna record ProRes video because that takes a lot more storage space. But the 14 Pro lineup, this will be available starting September the 16th, so the always on display, I told you, that was a rad apple. The execution here, let me, I need to move this to my other hand. Mm, chef's kiss, it is so good. Like. I love it. Then you have the dynamic island here. That deserves a good Apple. I mean, no one else is doing it. Not everyone will love it, but this is a feature with a function, and I think it's only gonna get better with more third-party support. And then finally, you got the camera systems, right? They get even better. No one is gonna complain about that. So in its totality, right, you have SOS emergency via satellite. You have crash detection. You have all of those things. We mentioned a brighter display, 2,000 nits, uh, what else did I, you know, 29 hours battery here, 23 hours battery life, gets you through the whole day. I, I just didn't expect to be as impressed with this iPhone as I was this year. I honestly wasn't, but I really, really, really like it after using it for a week. And if I've lived with lightning this long, guess what? I can do it another year. And that is the power of the Apple 
ecosystem. And you know what? If you're happy with the iPhone that you have, you do not need upgrade. Like don't let anyone tell you any different. If you're a techie that has to have the new shiny toy, guess what? You will not be disappointed by the improvements this year. Uh, as a content creator, I'm gonna make an upgrade to the 14 Pro. And then also, you know, if just in case you do make this upgrade, I know you're gonna absolutely love the always on display. You're gonna love it. And then that dynamic island, right? If you didn't think you'd like it before, um, I think it's gonna grow on you real fast. So there you go, my review of the iPhone 14 Pro, and guess what? It's good.